Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this lecture sponsored by Dilma Conservation. It's my pleasure to introduce to you this evening Dr. Simon Stewart. Simon, to anyone who's been involved in the global conservation scene, really doesn't need an introduction for the past 30 years. He has been at some part of the helm of the IUCN family. Uh, during the years, the eight years prior to 2016, he was the chairman of the Species Survival Commission, which is the global organization that produces the uh, IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. And before that, he acted as Secretary General of IUCN in Switzerland. And ever since his PhD at Cambridge University, I think longer ago than he cares to remember, he did his research in Tanzania on birds with profound conservation consequences for that country and since then many other countries. His impact on global conservation and especially on amphibian conservation, which is how I came into contact with him, has been so profound that in 2005, uh, we named a species of frog found in the Knuckles Hills, Pseudophilautus stuarti, after Simon, for his contribution to the global amphibian assessment. In that year, under Simon's leadership, every one of the world's amphibian species came to be assessed for the red list of threatened species. Now, his present visit to Sri Lanka is to try and get started a new assessment of the Sri Lankan amphibians for the global red list. The reason the amphibians take some pr priority in our thinking is because Sri Lanka has a hugely endemic amphibian fauna, more than 100 species, uh, largely endemic to us, and also very threatened. We have recorded many extinct species from Sri Lanka. There are about half the fauna in some form of endangerment. And for this reason, we need to make a new assessment. And Simon is here to persuade Dilma Conservation to engage with that initiative and get it started. He's here in his private capacity. And we've been working together with Dilma to try and map out a plan. Uh, to the future. So I don't want to detain you much longer, but ask you to welcome very warmly this evening, Dr. Simon Stewart. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rohan. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for inviting me to come. Uh, and it's nice to see a few old uh, friends. I can see uh, Nirmali and uh, Shirani here, and spent and, and Asanka, uh, who. Um, uh, we were all previously associated with IUCN and now we're all wearing different hats. So most of us have some sort of IUCN hat still. Um, and of course, uh, Rohan as well. Um, and uh, uh, I was asked to give this talk and the talk is about the IUCN Red List. Um, IUCN, as many of you will know, is the International Union for Conservation of Nature. It's a federation of NGOs and governments. The Sri Lankan government is a state member. A number of NGOs are members. And also within IUCN are commissions of experts, one of which the Species Survival Commission is responsible for the Red List. And uh, I'll now go through and tell you a bit about the Red List, what it contains, and what it's used for, and be very happy if you have any to ask, answer questions at the end. Um, so the Red List is the world's official and most comprehensive source of information on the extinction risk of species. And it's not just a list. If any of you have been onto the Red List website, iucnredlist.org, you will have noticed that it contains an awful lot of information. It's not just a list of names and how threatened the species are. There are distribution maps, uh, there's all sorts of information um, about how many there are of particular species, what the population trends are, etc. It's based on the best available scientific information and it's widely used to inform uh, and influence uh, conservation. And I'll give some examples of that later on. 
as I said, it's more than just names and threat categories. Um, uh, most of the species have maps, um, uh, distribution maps now, that, that didn't used to be the case. A lot of information on the threats that species face, habitat loss or overhunting or invasive species or pollution or whatever. Um, a very large amount of uh, information on the ecological requir requirements that species have and a lot of information on the conservation actions that they need. Um, and the whole thing is run through a peer-reviewed process. Uh, so leading experts do the assessments of the species and then independent people then review those assessments and um, uh, then they get submitted. I'll go through that process um, in a minute. But to give you an example, uh, yesterday I reviewed, uh, uh, I was asked to be the independent reviewer for two turtle species in New Guinea and today I, in the bit of spare time I had, I reviewed one frog from Palau and another one from Chile. So, so that's the sort of thing and there are thousands of people around the world doing this sort of thing every day. Um, so the red list assessment, that is the category that um, a species is given, is an estimate of, an, of extinction risk. It's not an estimate of conservation priority so much as of extinction risk. Um, so the question that's being asked by the red list categories is, what is the likelihood of a species becoming extinct in the near future, given what we know about it at the moment, about its population trends, range and threats. So, so that's, that's what it is about. Um, and it's a little bit like if you go to hospital to what the Americans call the emergency room, and in Britain we call A&E, accident and emergency, I think. And so if you go to a hospital, um, if you go to the emergency room, they have a set of criteria there on the left, and they'll be looking at, oh no, there we are, there. Um, um, uh, they'll be looking at, are you walking, are you breathing, um, what is your breathing rate, what is your circulation, and then they'll put you in categories ranging from dead, where you don't want to be, all the way through to priority three, you're really not that, it shouldn't be in the emergency room at all. Um, uh, and various different levels. And so they have criteria to put you in the category of how they're going to treat you. And the red list is a bit like that as well. It has criteria. Um, there are five criteria, A, B, C, D, and E. So population reduction, restricted geographic range, small population size and decline, very small or restricted population and a quantitative risk analysis. And around all of these criteria, there are numerical thresholds that decide which category you go into, ranging from extinct through to least concern. So extinct in the black, down to least concern where you're not, not at any elevated risk of extinction. So that, that is how it works. The details are much more complicated. Uh, there are probably a number of you here who have done, well I know there are a number of you here who have done red listing and you'll know that how it actually works out all the different criteria, sub-criteria and the different numerical thresholds are quite complicated and it requires some training um, but in principle it's about taking a species, taking what we know about it, applying the criteria and choosing the categories. And the other key thing is you only need to use one of the criteria to list the species in a category. Because for some species we won't know about population reduction, for others we won't be able to do a quantitative risk analysis, whatever. But as long as you can apply one of the criteria, you can put it in a category. That's basically how it works. Um, now, some very big scientific brains went into developing this system. It didn't happen overnight. And the two most famous people you've probably heard of um, were um, uh, Georgina Mace and Resi Tachikaya. Georgina Mace is a professor at the University College London and um, Resi Tachikaya is a Turkish biomathematician now at the Stony, Stony Brook University in Long Island, uh, New York. Um, and they are the people who over many years developed and improved uh, the system. When I was last in Sri Lanka in 1999, um, it uh, um, was um, uh, Resi Tachikaya was there. 
Anyone remember that? Yeah, you do. And if you so, um, we had a very interesting time with Resit answering questions. I remember, um, and he's still very involved to this day. And then lying behind the data collection uh, are, is the network of the IUCN Species Survival Commission. Here they are with all their logos. Actually, it's only some of them because we couldn't fit them all onto one slide. But there are about 140 of these groups that do the red listing and, and, and do, do the assessment. So it is dispersed across the world. Um, so uh, when the amphibians get reassessed for Sri Lanka, um, it'll be the uh, Sri Lankan members of the amphibian specialist group, which is on the top row there, that will, um, that will be doing that assessment. Also underlying the Red List are a set of organisations that, that have agreed to commit resources to it in various ways. And this is called the Red List Partnership. Um, and uh, um, you'll see some of those organisations there. And the people who work full time to hold this all together, you know, in so many systems in the world, you've got all the people up front who get the publicity, and then you've got the people behind the scenes who do the real work. Now, some of those people are the assessors, the individual scientific experts who are experts on a few species who contribute their data. They're the unsung heroes, if you like. And the other unsung heroes are these people, Craig Hilton Taylor and Caroline Pollock, who have been at the Red List unit, which is the central hub in the IUCN Secretariat that run the whole process and keep it on the road, make sure the Red List <coughs> website doesn't crash, make sure that all the updates coming in go in, make sure that any errors are dealt with, responding to all the people. So these two, um, some of you might have met them, are complete, um, a, a hero and a heroine who hold it together and they, they, the sort of people who don't get publicity and they don't seek it. Now a little bit about the assessment process. So it starts with data compilation. So you've got a species, let's say a species we've never assessed before. So the, all the information needs to be gathered and it gets put into what's called the SIS. The SIS is a species information service which is IUCN's online database um, that sits behind the red list and you've, and you've got certain data fields you have to fill in. You have mandatory data fields and you have voluntary data fields which you can only fill in if you have the information or if you want to. You must at least fill in all the mandatory data fields. And then when that's done, what normally happens, it goes to an assessment workshop where we get all the experts on a group of species, for example, Sri Lankan frogs, and we go through them all and we see how they're doing um, and, and all the different experts get to comment on the draft um, data compilation that took place. Um, and so, so that's um, what tends to happen. And so we're hoping later this year, for frogs for one example, that there'll be a new workshop where the, all the Sri Lankan frog experts will come together. They'll look at all the draft data that have been put together. They'll review it, improve it, update it, and they'll make sure that the correct red list criteria and categories are applied. And then from that, we ed end up with a draft, um, a, a draft assessment um, in the SIS. That's what you see there in the top right. That's what will come out of the workshop. It's is, is, is all been finished. It may be a little bit of extra work to be done after the workshop if there's some missing information or some particular expert couldn't make it. And then from that, a final, it becomes a final assessment and it is sent to the IUCN Red List unit, and that's to Craig and Caroline, and they just do spot checking. They can't check every species, there are way too many, and then it goes onto the Red List website. That's the process. Um, that uh, shows you what an SIS form looks like. Um, so that's what I was, uh, I was the other day I was um, reviewing this uh, critically endangered um, uh, a Malaysian giant turtle, for example. There are quite a number of uh, capacity building and training workshops. IUCN now has an online training course and an exam that you can use uh, for, for red listing. 
Um, uh, so you can go on if you're interested, you can take the course, you can do the exam online, um, and then you're a certified assessor. If you're really, really keen and obsessed with this stuff, you can take a more difficult exam with a very high pass mark, which is then you become a trainer. Once you've done that, IUCN will probably start annoying you and saying, we need you to go and do a, a training in New Guinea or a training in Ecuador or whatever. And, um, and so, because the, there are not so many trainers and there are a lot of training workshops. And so to try and get as many uh, trainers out there doing training workshops. This is a picture here of um, at the top. You can see Caroline Pollock do a training in in Ghana, and then there's another workshop in uh, Korea down, down below. Um, so these are pretty thorough workshops and they've become very successful over the years. So I told you a bit about the process, but what does it actually contain? Um, so the red list, maybe I'll just go through, yeah. The, the red list, um, I just checked last night to make sure these numbers were correct and I updated these slides because it changes frequently. The red list as of last night had 98,512 species in, in it. Um, uh, now they're not all threatened. Of those, um, oh, I've, I got a typo there, 27,100 and something, 150 say, are, um, are threatened and 941 are extinct or extinct in the wild. So 27, over 27,000 species are threatened with extinction at the, at the global level. Um, now that is out of 1.8 million described species and however, who knows how many in the world, some say 10 to 100 million, some 8 to 15 million is a lot. Most species in the world have still not been named by science. But we have 1.8 moving towards 1.9 million currently described, and IUCN has assessed just shy of, uh, of 100,000 of them. Um, now, IUCN is not attempting to assess the status of every species. It simply would be too much work, and we have to actually get on with real conservation. Um, we don't just want to be assessing species all the time. Um, and IUCN has done a calculation, I was involved in this, to work out how many species and which species do we need to assess so that the red list is what we call a reasonably accurate barometer of life, showing us what's happening to biodiversity as a whole. And the answer to that is about 150,000 species, with a big increase in the number of assessments of plants, of fungi, marine species and invertebrates. So, um, so that's where the big focus is going on at the moment. And the plan is within the next few years to get the number of assessed species up to around 150,000 and then keep it at around that level, though it'll probably still creep up. But the key thing is, even though these numbers sound big, they're only the tip of the iceberg like that little red halo there on top of the iceberg, they only need the tip of what actually exists out there in, um, um, in biodiversity as a whole. And so in the end, the red list has to be, we hope, representative of a much larger number of species that have not been assessed and probably never will be assessed. Um, now, this is not the easiest um, graph to see, so, um, uh, so uh, um, apologies for that, but I'll try and explain it. So I've gone through here some different taxonomic groups of species. So we have selected bony fishes at the top, all the way down to cycads on the bottom. And the more um, red, orange or yellow you have in there, the more threatened that um, uh, uh, group is. And the more green you've got, the less threatened. And so... Um, so, uh, and you see a red line somewhere in the middle, and the red line is the best estimate of the percentage of threatened species in that taxonomic group. So you see the most threatened group we've looked at so far, the cycads. The dinosaurs of the plant world look a bit like palms, but are totally unrelated to palms. Um, the next are the amphibians that Rohan just mentioned. Um, is the most, um, next most threatened. Then there's selected groups of dicot plants, then selected reptiles, conifers, 
reforming corals, etc. Um, and the least threatened are the birds, selected gastropod mollusks, and selected bony fishes. But actually, if you take the bony fishes and you separate out the freshwater from the marine, you find that the freshwater are much more threatened than the marine. Uh, which is interesting because, of course, a huge amount of um, media attention is on marine conservation compared with freshwater conservation. That doesn't mean that marine conservation is unimportant. It just means that so far, because of the scale of the oceans, the number of globally threatened species is relatively small. But that could easily change. Um, but it's just what the data say at the moment. Um, as I said, there are maps of many of the species. And what we've found in this is um, the patterns of threat vary a lot um, uh, between different tax taxonomic groups. So what we've done here is we've overlaid all the maps of all the threatened amphibians, all the threatened birds, and all the threatened mammals. So threatened amphibians is top right. First of all, there are no threatened amphibians in the sea. That won't surprise you. Um, uh, uh, and the darker the red, the more threatened amphibians there are. So although over 40% of amphibians in the world are threatened, most of the world <coughs> has no threatened amphibians at all. It's white on the map. So threatened amphibians are particularly concentrated in a relatively small number of places, including in the southwest of your own country, uh, which comes out strongly there. Um, uh, and you see amphibians are particularly threatened in the montane tropics. Um, by contrast, threatened birds on the left are much more evenly spread across the world. There's a bigger concentration perhaps in Asia and Southeast Asia, and you see darker blues in the southern oceans, um, albatrosses and penguins and things, um, but much more evenly spread than threatened amphibians. And if you look at threatened mammals, you'll see a huge concentration in tropical Asia of threatened mammals, especially in Southeast Asia, um, and a fair amount in the Andes and places like that as well. Um, uh, threatened mammals are more broadly distributed than threatened amphibians. Um, and so that just gives you an idea. And the key message for conservation here is there are many taxonomic groups are not good indicators of the threat patterns of other taxonomic groups. And so in trying to work out which species we need to um, assess for the IUCN Red List, we've been trying to understand which new ones do we need to do that will add new information because no other group currently assessed is a good indicator of it. And that's what we've been trying to do. It's a little bit hard, but that's our, our best attempt, trying to add in species that have either different distribution patterns or different causes of threat, because those are likely to give rise to different patterns. Because in the end, we want um, the red list to show us which are the places on the, and on the earth that we need to look after the most. Um, the other sad news is that the extinction crisis is getting worse. I think you already knew that. I think everyone who came here already knew that. Um, uh, but IUCN uh, looks at this through a thing called the Red List Index. And the Red List Index looks at the genuine changes in status across those Red List categories, going from, um, say, uh, least concerned to near threatened to vulnerable to endangered to critically endangered to extinct. Genuine changes that take place across those categories for a whole group of species to calculate its Red List Index. And when you look at it at the global level, what you'll find is that um, there's not a single group of species for which the line is going up. The line is going down for every group of species. Now, the Red List Index is very simple. If you have no threatened species in a group, you will score one on the Red List Index. And if all your species are extinct, you'll have zero. So the mowers of New Zealand, their Red List Index is zero. Um, so for these groups, you've got some like the cycads that are down to nearly 0.5. So that's pretty bad, pretty bad. Um, and you'll see the, the level of the slope varies. The blue is the thing that the clever statisticians have done to um, average across the um, different um, taxonomic groups. And the, but you'll see that birds that receive a lot of 
conservation attention are going down, but it's a fairly gradual line. Whereas you're seeing amphibians um, and cycads are f in a worse overall situation. They're lower down the y-axis and their slope is higher. But the thing that really jumps out to most people from this graph is the corals. Um, so the corals have the steepest slope and back in the mid-1990s um, uh, there were very, very few threatened reef building corals in the world at a global level. There were local threats, but the advent of global warming, as I'm sure you know, are very um, f uh, familiar about in the oceans, and the warming of ocean surface temperatures has caused coral bleaching and um, serious declines in ma many coral species around the world. Coupled with the fact that um, ocean acidification is also impacting and is likely to impact more coral species. So corals are on a much steeper um, uh, uh, decline trajectory than any other species group we've looked at at the moment. And I said a little while ago that there are very few threatened marine fish species. This is why we can't be very confident about a statement like that, because there are huge changes going on in, in the oceans and uh, loss of coral reef habitats is bound to have very significant um, impacts on ocean chemistry and on available habitat for a very large number of species. Um, okay, so this is all bad news, right? Do you want a bit of better news? Yeah? So here's a study that I did with a few of my colleagues uh, with Mike Hoffman, who some of you might know, and a few others. Um, because what we wanted to do was to say, can we use the red list to try and understand what is the impact of all the conservation we've done so far? Because if you look at graphs like the ones I've shown you up until now, you could be forgiven for coming away and thinking, this is a depressing thing, this conservation stuff. Why are we doing it? It never works. Everything's going down. <coughs> Couldn't we find something more useful to do that might be successful? Um, but many people involved in conservation know that we have some successes, but they're not showing through on the Global Red List Index or on WWF's Living Planet Index or things like that. So what we did, we, we ran a thought experiment and we took all the world's ungulates, the deer and antelopes and wild cattle and things like that, um, about 250 species, I think, and we looked at what happened in the Red List Index between 1996 and 2008 for the uh, world's ungulates, and that is it. That's the observed Red List Index. It went down. And then we said, uh, we're going to conduct, conduct a thought experiment, and then we're going to imagine that in 1996 we decided to stop conservation of ungulates. So we will get rid of any protected area that is conserving ungulates, we'll degazette that, we will stop all hunting controls, we'll stop CITES, we'll stop uh, captive breeding in zoos, well, whatever is doing good for, uh, for um, ungulates, we're going to stop doing it. And we set up a set of decision rules as to what would happen, knowing about the pressures, and it's all written up in the paper we published. And the answer is, if we'd stopped all conservation over that 12 year period, just 12 years, that is what would have happened to the Red List Index. It would have actually been seven or eight times worse than what actually happened in just 12 years. So the difference between those two lines is the impact of conservation, which is actually quite big. So the main problem with conservation is we don't do enough of it. Um, where we do do it, it actually has an impact. And what we're doing is slowing down the decline rate. For certain species, we're reversing it. Um, but, um, but things will be much worse without all this huge amount of effort that everyone did. This is published in Conservation Biology if anyone's interested. Um, um, and I can send a PDF, though I think it's open access. Um, Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust, um, which is an organisation that does a lot of really good work on threatened species, have um, looked at this and they've gone even further and they looked at um, I'll do the next slide and basically uh, they've been working on a set of species for a long period of time and done so much good that they actually got their red list index line to go up they actually got it to go up um, and then they looked at what would have happened if they hadn't done that and it would have gone down. So, so they have shown that if you run a long-term, a very intentional conservation program, you can turn, start turning the corner. 
Having said that, um, I, I just said a moment ago, the main problem with conservation is we don't do enough of it. That is true, but I would be lying to you if I said that was the only problem. Um, and the reason why it's more complicated and just not doing enough of it is we are facing a whole set of problems that we're finding it very hard to figure out what to do. Some forms of over-harvesting uh, of species we've simply been unable to get under control. Um, in principle we know what to do, but in practice on the ground, especially when the economic value of a species is through the roof, in an area of poor law enforcement or corruption, it becomes very, very hard to deal with. Dams and river fragmentation, it has proven very difficult to stand up to the economic powers behind it. More seriously in many ways, and this is part of the amphibian story, is no novel diseases. Diseases that we have no cure for in the wild, like amphibian chytridiomycosis, and there are other examples, for example, affecting bats in North America or the Tasmanian devil in Australia. The impacts of climate change, that's the coral story. Ocean acidification, that's the coral story again. Disruptions to migration. So there are some things where we're going to have to take more radical um, action or come up with um, uh, novel solutions. Um, in particular, ones that I've worked on in recent years, or my colleagues have, that um, are of serious concern are these ones, the amphibians, corals, and a number of the Asian, tropical Asian uh, large animals. Um, and the amphibian story, I mean, amphibians, many of them have very tiny geographic ranges, and there's no better example of that than Sri Lanka, where you have amphibians with very tiny ranges. But correct me if I'm wrong, Rohan, but um, the amphibians in Sri Lanka appear not to have been affected by uh, chytridiomycosis. There are reasons for that, uh, and that's good, and count yourself lucky. Um, but in other parts of the world, this disease has been devastating. Um, I might just point out that that um, gastric brooding frog on the top right there, with its mouth being held open by a paper clip, and you see the baby um, coming out, that species, there were two species on, in Australia, it's extinct because of this, this uh, disease. They were the only frogs that brooded their young in their stomachs. Um, and um, and that is a whole breeding strategy that is extinct. And there are many other sad stories like that. Um, corals, I just mentioned it again, so I won't repeat it. But it is perhaps the most um, serious environmental um, crisis coming down the line because it's going to do terrible damage to, um, uh, we're, going to, we're, going to we're in danger of losing the most diverse ecosystem in the seas um, and associated with that are the human livelihood benefits related to coral reefs, uh, the fisheries and everything associated with it and the coastline protection that, that uh, coral reefs uh, provide. So, um, so this is one where we're really going to have to do a lot more to figure out a solution. And as I just pointed out, there's been um, massive wildlife declines in recent years, in, especially in Southeast Asia and, and China. Um, so in the last section, because I know time is moving on, um, I wanted to say a bit more about how the Red List is used. When we set it up, um, I was involved from the beginning back in the early 1990s working with Georgina Mace. We thought it was just going to be a thing where we'd find out how threatened species were and people would then go on and use that information to plan conservation. Um, and that is um, one of the ways it's used, but we had no idea back in the um, 25 years ago how it would be used. So it is indeed used for conservation planning and priority setting. I'm just going to quickly go through these and explain them. Informing conservation priority, influencing um, uh, funding allocations, private sector decision making, education and awareness, and, and scientific analysis and information. So just on conservation planning and priority, priority setting, this is sometimes done at the species level. So here's a frog that was unfortunately killed by this terrible disease. Um, um, and the Red List has a ton of information for informing species um, specific conservation actions and priorities. Huge amount of information 
in there and conservation groups are using it for that purpose every day. Um, but it's also used, for example, for site-based um, uh, 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 conservation and prior planning and priority setting. So this is a map of the Alliance for Zero Extinction sites, which are the places in the world which have um, uh, at least one uh, critically endangered or endangered species occurring nowhere else. And you can see these sites scattered across the world, including in Sri Lanka um, and up the Western Ghats. Um, uh, this is an out-of-date map, by the way, but it's, I'm just getting the, the principles here. Um, and uh, the red list is used extensively for um, then defining and identifying key biodiversity areas, which was um, another one of the things we were discussing with Asanka today. And then um, uh, um, uh, because key biodiversity areas are also an increasingly widely used currency, as it were, in the conservation planning and decision making world. Um, the red list is used to inform policy. So uh, Rohan won't like this si slide because we had an interesting discussion last night about CITES, Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. Um, but uh, this is an analysis that someone did a, a few years ago. It's looked at which of the amphibians in the world that are threatened by international trade found that 2% uh, of them are on CITES Appendix 1, trade ban, or um, CITES Appendix 2. 40% uh, of them, uh, which is regulated trade, which meant that 58% are not on CITES. Now, whether that's a good thing or not is something to be discussed, but at least we need to know that. And that's the sort of information that is policy relevant that comes out of the Red List. The Red List doesn't tell you what to do about it. It provides the factual information to decide what to do. Um, a group of people have also been looking at information in the red, red list on the livelihood values that species have, because that's another thing that's collected in the red list is some of the livelihood values. And so this is um, just looking at the, um, the birds, um, and uh, this shows you that um, use as pets is actually the commonest way in which uh, um, people are deriving some livelihood benefit off wild birds. Um, uh, and then the next thing is to eat the birds, have the food, and then birds are sport, that's probably sport hunting and things like that. And then the other ways, fashion, medicine, hand, handicrafts are very seldom used. Uh, so that surprised me because that's um, about a third of the world's bird species being used as pets, that's a lot. Um, so it's um, also policy relevant information. Um, but the Red List is also used for um, uh, policy setting that's not about species per se. So for instance, these Red List index lines here, this is a slide I showed you earlier, um, have been used by um, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity and the countries that are members of that convention, including Sri Lanka, to see if they are meeting the IT biodiversity targets that were set under that convention. And it'll be used again for the post-2020 targets to see if the curve can be bent, because that's what the governments are talking about now, bending the downward curve um, in, in the Red List Index and various other indices that are used by the Convention on Biological Diversity. The Red List is heavily used in funding allocations, so the Global Environment Facility um, has what's called a system for transparent allocation of resources. We can argue about whether it's transparent or not, but that's what they call it. Um, and that basically is an algorithm that decides how much money each country gets under the GEF. Um, and one of the main data sets used in the system for transparent allocation of resources is the red list. So, so the amount of money Sri Lanka gets from the GEF is partly determined by the red list. Other data sets as well. Um, the Mohammed bin Zayed Species Conservation Fund, one of the main species funding bodies, only funds um, uh, threatened species. They preferentially fund critically endangered species. Um, uh, the same is true of IUCN Save Our Species Fund um, and, and, and several others like that. So the red list is used in funding allocations. Now one of the least discussed ways in which the red list is used is in private sector decision making. 
uh, because up until now I've really been talking about how the Red List is used to do good, to make more conservation happen, to fund conservation in the right way, to get better policies, all of that. But the Red List is also used by the private sector in particular to avoid damage. So instead of, uh, in addition to doing good, it's also done to avoid damage, preventing a negative rather than doing a positive. Um, now, there's a special website called the IBAT, the Integrated Biodiversity Assessment Tool, that um, is heavily used by businesses around the world. Um, uh, and there are three main data sets in IBAT. Uh, they are the World Database on Protected Areas or Protected Planet, that's represented by the blue circle there. The red list, um, uh, the middle circle, and then the key biodiversity area data set as well. They are brought together in IBAT through an online GIS t as a decision support tool so that any company that is building a road or government that's building a road or um, financial institution that is funding a road or a mine or a dam or whatever can look and see what impact that would have. And um, they have to do this because of this, is a huge amount of the financing you need for infrastructure projects in the world comes from lenders that follow what is called the IFC performance standards. The IFC, International Finance Corporation, is the branch of the World Bank that lends to the private sector. And it has set what's called a set of performance standards that um, must be met in order to receive a loan from the IFC. So performance standard six is the environmental safeguards, um, but there are performance standards on poverty, on gender, on health, on whatever. So the, so the IFC demand to know what the collateral impacts are of any project that it finances, and if it doesn't know that and isn't satisfied, it won't fund them. A very large number of lenders now follow the IFC performance standards because lenders can't be bothered to develop their own standards. They just lift the IFC uh, performance standards by and large. This just shows you in a single year lending that used IBAT, used the three data sets I just showed you in making lending decisions. $60 billion of loans from the um, the World Bank, 20 billion from the Asian Development Bank. Um, you see these other ones here. The Creative Principles, um, there's a whole set of banks, 200 billion. OECD credit agencies, 50 to 100 billion. These are sums way, way bigger than what the world spends on conservation um, uh, and, uh, and has been subject to environmental safeguards. So the Red List is used in this way. Most conservationists and scientists don't even know about it. I would argue it's one of the biggest impacts that the Red List has. Um, and this is all gathered speed only in the last few years. Um, more obviously, the Red List is used for education and awareness. Um, uh, IUCN has an amazing species. It puts up frequently in its website. Um, and uh, there's an increasing um, collaboration between zoos and aquaria and botanic gardens. Uh, it says over 70 zoos here, but it's many more now. Uh, but I couldn't get the right number for the, uh, this talk, um, are, are using red list information in their displays. And then perhaps best known to some of us, uh, those of us as scientists here, there's a phenomenal an ongoing set of papers. There's a whole industry of research papers using red list data that are now coming out in many journals. It's increased enormously over the years. Um, and we believe that it's incredibly important for the seriousness with which the Red List is taken and the rigour and the imparti impar impartiality it has. Um, and so you get studies like this. This is one that some people did looking at um, the um, uh, different levels of threat of different taxonomic groups and the level of uncertainty there were in um, uh, around those estimates. Um, this is one that was done looking at um, uh, different drivers of threat and how they, they varied. Um, and so this is just very simple analyses, but the more complex ones are done and people are getting quite, quite creative about how they use these data. And the data are openly available. You can download them. If it's not for commercial use, you can just download them and analyze them. So a lot of the Red List is bad news stories like this uh, Chinese paddle fish, I believe it was one of the longest fresh water fish species in the world. It's probably extinct because of the Three Gorges Dam. Um, 
But um, I was planning to do this anyway, but Rohan last night um, emphasized that I should do this, is to remind ourselves that actually there are a fair number of good news stories, and some of those have happened because they got highlighted by the Red List. So these are all recovering species. Did you know the giant pandas are recovering species? It was down listed a few years ago. The Indian rhino there, California condor, these are just some. Um, um, even this, I was talking about the, the threats to Asian species, but this is the Chinese crested ibis that was almost extinct. It came under Chinese-led, highly intensive um, uh, conservation program in the nick of time, and now there are several hundred birds in the wild. Um, so uh, stories like this we perhaps don't hear enough of. And perhaps the most spectacular of all, all is this fellow, the humpback whale. Uh, which is um, since the end of humpback whaling, I can't remember, several decades ago now, um, this species has gone into exponential population growth. It's still way lower than it was before the whaling era, but, but it's, um, you know, back in my own country of the UK, the long extinct humpback whale migration off southwest England is beginning to redevelop, beginning to come back. We'll be doing eco-tours for humpback whales along with so many other countries before long. Uh, so I just wanted to celebrate the good news with you given I put a lot of um, uh, bad news into the story. But hopefully that's a summary of what the red light it is, what its purpose is. Um, but I'm very happy to answer or try to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much.